Hello everyone, my name is Ayanda. I'm from South Africa and I'm an ex-Jehovah's Witness. And this is my story. So, I was born into a family that were already Jehovah's Witnesses and I was raised as one from as far back as I can remember. I'm currently 35, turning 36 later in the year and I was a Jehovah's Witness for the first 30 years of my life, really. I was baptized at the age of 12, um, December 7, I think it was the 7th, uh, 1996, um, at a district convention in uh, a university back when I, in the town I, I was raised in. So my dad was an, was an elder, is still an elder as far as I know, um, and I was a quintessential elder son, you know, got away with a bit, but also had to toe the line because we were supposed to be an exemplary family. This is who I was. This is who I am. Um, I do say that I'm an ex-Jehovah's Witness. Um, I'm not really sure, um, according to them, because uh, obviously I'm not, a, I'm not disfellowshipped. Um, I've never had a judicial committee. I think I will talk about this in, the, in, in this um, story that I'm telling. However, you know how, how it goes with them. Um, maybe it was done in absentia. Uh, maybe I disassociated myself through my actions, probably, you know. So, yeah, no one really cares about the games they play. Essentially, I would love to tell my story. Um, I hope that this channel I can use to do interviews, more roundtable kind of topics on things that affect me and those around me, and just to tell our stories, especially from an African context and an African perspective, if there is, a, is one when it comes to being a Jehovah's Witness, but there's always those nuanced things. And I feel like maybe I needed to finally add my voice as a young South African, young African guy who has had to experience um, of being raised in this religion. So I'll just make this read not too long, not too short, but just give a basic overview of who I am. Um, I was fortunate enough um, when I was raised as a Jehovah's Witness that my parents still allowed me uh, somehow to go get higher education as it were. And I studied finance and I work as an, as an accountant and I do okay with that. And in a way, I'm glad because when I had to leave, I did number one, I was 30 and old, really, um, and very independent, but also I didn't have um, certain problems when it comes to being truly on my own because of what happened. I am currently 100% shunned by my family, uh, my mom and dad, my two sisters, um, their husbands, um, and essentially the a part of my family that is um, still Jehovah's Witnesses. This religion came into our lives because I think my grand was a Jehovah's Witness um, towards the 1975 time, became a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, my parents then became Jehovah's Witnesses. Me and my sisters are born in the early 80s, between 82, my older sister, myself in 84, my younger sister in 87. So we were raised around the time our parents are getting baptized my dad becomes an elder, a minister, a servant, and an elder very quickly. And yeah, Bob's your uncle. We all uh, move towards hoping that this generation that saw 1914 would not die, um, hopefully before the new millennium year 2000. And yeah, everyone was looking forward to that, I guess, one way or the other. I never liked being a Jehovah's Witness. I just did it well. I became a ministerial servant at the age of 19. I went away to go study, obviously. I was doing my first year, um, year 2004, around April-ish, around there, uh, memorial time, as they call it, in, the, in, the, in that religion. And yeah, I was appointed a ministerial servant. And I was one, <laughs> really, um, for the longest time. I never became an elder, funny enough. But yeah. I was a ministerial servant. I had a group study, so I conducted a group. Funny enough, I was in a in a congregation with like five or six elders, but I think geographically, in terms of where I lived, the families around which I lived, the then I was the guy who conducted the group study for some reason. 
um, enjoyed that. I remember it was around the time we were redoing the Revelation book, early 2000, um, I want to say 2007, 8, um, around that time, 2006, 7, 8, yeah. Um, it obviously had a, meant you had to be responsible for a lot because you had to make sure your group was also sorted with the um, uh, the preaching work in your area uh, and so forth. So I took the lead in that in my group. Um, even though I was a young ministerial servant, I had two other ministerial servants in my group who were also my friends. These guys later when I got married became one of my best men, both of them. So yeah, and one of them was actually my housemate. Um, so yeah, we were like this little group, group clique of young 24, 25 year old young Jehovah's Witness boys um, who seemingly had the Jehovah's Witness uh, world kingdom at their feet, so to speak. We hadn't, we were the ones who hadn't gone to Bertha like our, maybe our friends, but because we were doing higher education and it just started working, I think around those times anyway, but we're still seen as very exemplary in terms of uh, the kingdom work. Um, being a Jehovah's Witness around that time was also interesting. I was also an account servant in my congregation and also in the in the district. Uh, I think, yeah, maybe because of what I studied and I worked in finance. Maybe it was because of that. I don't know. But yeah, so I did that in my congregation as well. A pretty big congregation. Pretty one of those so-called big congregations um, that everyone looks up to because you have a lot of elders who used to be in Bethel. You know, the ones everyone always talks about on the videos. Yes, I was in one of those. Um, and because my dad kind of, now that I, I'm out, you realize it's just patronage and stuff. Um, so I also happened to conduct the theocratic ministry school in that kind of, in the kingdom hall in Devon. I can mention it. Devon, Pine Town. I was in the Pine Town congregation, the Zulu, Isi Zulu congregation, which is a native language spoken in South Africa. Um, yeah. So do forgive me if I mess up some of the words, especially in English and don't call them by the correct watchtower term um i was only ever a jehovah's witness technically in isizu which is the language um which is my first language even though i'm pretty english is fine for me but you know how they have their own words and sometimes you realize oh wait you know i've never been a jehovah's witness in english so sometimes some of these words would escape you yeah right yeah but yeah i conducted the theocratic ministry school um as a ministerial servant funny enough and yeah enjoyed it you know I, I was really into the teaching i was really into doctrines and thought that this was superior logic i think that's what appealed to me i'm quite a nerdy person you know i love to read i mean you can see library here i read everything i read 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 so back then i was a kid who would always read the watchtowers and then i'll ask my dad something like oh i read this in the watchtower um you know and my dad yeah you engage with me one or two twice but never really deep questions um, until I, maybe around teenage, when I was a teenager, then I wasn't really interested in the meeting so much. So I was a kid who would still be reading because I felt like what was being said, I'd already read because we'd studied it the day before or what have you. So I would be that kid reading the, watching the world, um, uh, questions from readers, um, a report from a Jehovah's Witness in Panama, like, you know, those kind of things. Definitely the life stories of the Jehovah's Witnesses that were being mentioned in the books. So I was that kid, you know. Um, I got married. Um, I won't really talk about that. I don't just out of respect also for my ex-wife. But just on a personal note, I was married um, as a Jehovah's Witness in 2011. And me and my ex-wife subsequently uh, became Jehovah's Witnesses, lived together, divorced and so forth later on in life and everything like that. However... The thing I would go into is that when I stopped being a Jehovah's Witness, it was around 2015, it finally hit me that this was not the truth. And I absolutely couldn't ignore it anymore. It's, um, I went just before I did this video, I've been wanting to do this for maybe five years, <laughs> to be honest, because I've been inspired by everyone else's videos between not having the time, unlike now during the time of COVID, we're all staying at home in South Africa, lockdown, so one has time. Um, but just generally, for some reason, I just have never gotten around to it. And my cousins have been inspiring me to say, look, man, 
as more of us come out of this religion to tell your story you were the first one to do this you got us here now help yeah so i'm inspired to finally tell my story so i went and found my old journals i used to write stuff in because when i started to research this religion i wrote down everything like if i would watch a v someone's video i'll be writing down the watchtower reference and then i'll go back and read it and i'm like oh my gosh it's true what did this guy say oh because you know we were taught that apostates lie and all that and then you realize after a while well you know what actually nope everything is true so i i found this very interesting page i don't know if you can see it reasons why i left um why i am terminating my membership as a jehovah's witness it's right there um i found it interesting i actually wrote a full two pages um of the reasons why i am stopping being a jehovah's witness almost three pages yeah so uh i found it interesting just reading one or two of them the number one reason why i stopped being a jehovah's witness for me 100 percent, it was a doctrine um because like i said earlier while i was a good jehovah's witness in terms of following the tenets and the rules i never really liked it um and i only did it because i thought it was true if i can ever if anyone ever was to ask me ayanda why did you stop i stopped because i found out it was a lie the only reason why i'd ever done it was because it was true i never liked being a jehovah's witness i never really liked being sunburned by the african sun and on a weekend wearing a tie going preaching but i did it very well you know i, was, I would even auxiliary pioneer while i had a full-time job because that is what i was taught was jehovah's requirement um so the day i i watched one or two of the videos and then decided boom actually you know what let's go down the rabbit hole i think for me it was actually the other way around i went down the rabbit hole of reading one or two things and it just didn't click uh, anymore and it just something was off and i remember sitting there thinking you know i've always heard about apostates but i've never heard what they have to say and then i watched one or two videos um and even before that um one of the main things that happened to me in 2015 is my ex-wife and uh, now moved into another city um in another province completely say another state american um english um in our case it's a province but it was like a, a three hour flight or two hour flight away almost um and so now you alone during the week um and then it's thursday and it's a time to go to the meeting this is now 2015 and i'll be like nah and i think once or twice i'll even lie to her things like yeah i was at a meeting but then i, I wouldn't go and i'll just sit around and then yeah or whatever it was just it was whatever you know that feeling and then i remember thinking wait and if you really think jehovah can see you why are you comfortable with the fact that technically you are lying to him? He knows you didn't go to the meetings. And instantly I realized, wait, I don't think Jehovah exists. Imagine saying that to yourself while you are believing Jehovah's Witness. That's what happened to me. The first thing I ever said to myself was, wait, I don't think Jehovah exists. I remember having this conversation with myself. And realizing, actually I am them. And this is a test of how I realized I was actually, I didn't believe in their vision of God, firstly. I told you guys that I used to be, I was a ministerial servant, so I had all these parts. Obviously, this would include doing a whole lot of public talks in even in other neighboring congregations, all of these things I did. Um, so obviously, you have to pray, right, in meetings. Now listen to this. As I am, as I sit here today, 35 years old, I have never ever prayed to God, to Jehovah, to God, except when I had a part in a meeting. And here's the kicker. I never even thought that there was anything wrong with that. So this is how I then realized wait, maybe I really am an unbeliever. I just didn't know I was. Um, because I don't think that I would do the parts and the praying. I never felt any conflict. Maybe my conscience was dead, as they put it there. But honestly, I never once felt anything wrong with the fact that I'm going to go up there and pray. I knew that Jehovah's Witness prayer. I could follow it. And quite frankly, I kind of meant it. 
But there was nothing in me that said, well, now I'm about to go sleep, let me do a prayer. Or now me and my wife are about to do something, let's say a prayer. It was, I was not religious, you know, it was just, I was not religious. And the Jehovah's Witness thing was just what we did as Jehovah's Witnesses. But I don't think I'd ever been convinced of anything anyway. And now that you're out, you realize, well, of course you wouldn't have been convinced because this was not really something you had to be convinced of. It was something you had to follow. Um, so that's kind of my story with that. So the doctrine, certainly, I was one. Um, the rule by fear. I hated this. I'm a, quite an independent person as a human being. Um, so I hate their rule by fear, disfellowshipping, family isolation, being marked, um, all these things I wrote down as things that I was not okay with. Um, the hypocrisy, big one. And this is one that exists in my culture. I don't know why, but in South Africa, you know, I've, I, I always hear people, and that's why I was like, maybe I would like to take this from an Af African perspective. I hear a lot of people say, well, in Africa, there is no internet, there is all of this. Um, but the funny thing is, in South Africa, and definitely in KwaZulu Natal, Gauteng, the provinces I've lived in, but generally in the whole of South Africa, I would say Jehovah's Witnesses are relatively more learned people, so to speak, and also more affluent and more well off. If I look at the neighborhood I grew up in, the people were Jehovah's Witnesses. We had the, I had this conversation with my cousin just the other day, and we were laughing, and I said. The people who were Jehovah's Witnesses when we were growing up, including our parents, were people who, even though we were living through apartheid South Africa at the time, who had gotten a relatively good education and maybe had professional jobs. You know, at the time, it's things like your teachers, your nurses, your some financial administrators, some administrators, office administrators, lawyers, lecturers, those kind of guys, for some weird reason. So if I look at my community, I grew up in certainly um, and to a point where some of these people would be able to finance their kids going to Bethel and still be able to buy them cars and have them go to Bethel is just a thing they do and they can still financially support them. Um, we were the, that, that generation, even though there's black tax settlers in South Africa, uh, which is when usually black kids um, have to go back and sort out the situation at home financially because you're usually the first one who's made, who's made it out of a cycle of poverty, so to speak. To be honest, I will say within the Jehovah's Witness community in South Africa, and there's a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses here. I think the last time when I was still a Jehovah's Witness in 2015, there were about 100,000, give or take. Um, so it's generally affluentish people, upwardly mobile, I think. So this the, 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 the point I was making with that is the religious superiority complex. Um, that I uh, found. Um, I think it appeals, the Jehovah's Witness packaging of the doctrine appeals to those kind of people who have a certain level of education, but they haven't gone slightly further maybe, um, because suddenly within a spiritual context, this comes, is packaged like pseudo-intellectualism of some sort. It appeals to them, but unfortunately the byproduct of that is it creates a certain level of superiority complex, I think, from in people. And certainly, I, I picked this up. Um, and then, the fundamental doctrines I state here in back then that didn't work for me was 1914, this generation, incorrect prophecies and blaming publishers, uh, i.e. 1925, 1975. Uh, Ever-changing understanding of the of those who are going to heaven, big one, right? Um, to suit the passage of time. So these were the things that I had worked out. And then I decided to do some more research and then everything changed. Um, but Sarim, false literature, uh, such as the, the way to paradise, studies in the scriptures, the harp of God, millions now living will never die, the finished mystery and so forth. How 1914 was calculated, massive one. I remember thinking if 1914 is incorrect, then the whole thing is wrong. And that's true. And I love the fact that whenever I see videos here, and this is what everyone is saying. So when I realized that it was all a lie, I stopped being a Jehovah's Witness. Um, I just stopped. I just couldn't do it anymore. 
um, and then in June 2016, um, I told my parents. But by then, I'd already really stopped. I was no longer going to meetings at all. And the funny thing is, um, my grandma passed away in January 2016, who was the matriarch of my uh, family, the side of my dad, which is all Jehovah's Witness. And I, when she passed away, a couple of things happened in the funeral that finally made me realize I cannot be a part of this. And that was the last Jehovah's Witness thing I was ever in. My grandma's funeral, January 16, 2016. Um, and then after that, I think I, I did still attend because my ex-wife flew up and we, I, we still attended the memorial of that year. That was then the next time I went to a meeting, which was about two months later. Um, and also that was the last time I was ever at a kingdom hall. Um, and last time I ever saw any of my friends who I was in a congregation with these people. By then, all the time I was in a ministerial servant, I was not serving as one because I'd had a couple of brushings with these guys over m m miniature things like wearing tight pants. Long before there were the articles on those things, guys, I was the guy who went to the back room as a ministerial servant because I was wearing tight pants. You know, and I stood my ground even then. I don't remember it. Um, I also was taken to a back room because I'm, I'm quite a... There, there's a word for it. I'm pretty, I don't know, light style or whatever. So, like, I do my nails, for example. I'm that kind of guy. I do my nails, I do my beard. Well, I didn't have a beard then, but, like, I do my nails and stuff. And I got called into the back room. Uh, remember, it was the presiding overseer and the service overseer, and who were also my childhood uh, other dads because they were we had grown up in the same congregation to my dad's friend. Um, so they had it was more casual, you know how it is because hey boy, you know you don't have to do this. Come on, um, yeah. So the next day, I remember going back to my nail lady and telling her, "Well done, file it off then and whatever you." I put key nail polish. I was literally that guy. I to me, I just always pushed the envelope. I always felt like if it wasn't in the Bible, it wasn't even a thing. In fact, I didn't even think it was going to be a thing until they called me. Yeah. So that was my life. Um, you guys can tell I'm pretty upbeat now, but. On a serious note, as I close off this, uh, we're at 22 minutes now. Let's just do three more minutes. Hopefully, I want to wrap up. But living the Jehovah's Witnesses was the single hardest thing, of, uh, thing I've ever done in my life. My entire life was appended in a lot of ways. But the one that hurts me the most, still today, five years later, is I lost my family. My mom, my dad, my, my sisters, um, we don't have a relationship at all, completely. Um, they shun me, my, except one or two things that they will try and do. But I find that with me, I I don't like the fact that you're trying to only have a relationship with me based on what the Watchtower organization says you can. Um, sorry, just to uh, have spoken a lot. Um, but yeah, so it was tough for me. Um, did a lot of therapy. Did a lot of self introspection. Had to use, I was on sleeping pills for two years because I couldn't sleep. I was so stressed out. But I also knew that I'm never going back. And there were days where I would put your guys' videos and watch and watch and watch and not feel alone. Maybe I think in wrapping up, um, and I will do a lot of other videos, maybe picking up minor topics and little bad sized topics and my view on it, the African perspective on it, and so forth, and how I see it playing out. Um, to be honest, a lot of what happened as a Jehovah's Witness, I think my mind sub subconsciously has blocked it out. I do have a good memory, but I do realize some of it I just can't remember. And it's not so much that I can't remember the events. It's weird for me. I'm quite a passionate person, so if I don't have an emotion attached to something anymore, it kind of just fizzles out. Fizzles out and I think... I am completely un emotionally detached from the first 30 years of my life when I was a Jehovah's Witness. Um, that sometimes it's hard. But I also believe that we really have to speak up. This religion must fall because it is, it is devastating. It's not even a religion. I am one of those people who believes in calling it a cult. I call it that loudly. Anyone who watches this who knows me, it's a cult. Jehovah's Witness is a cult. They fit every last little definition, Steve Hansen's pipe model, everything else. So living was tough. 
but I left and I've been gone for five years and if I am blessed with the length of days and I'm still here 30 years from now, I still won't be a Jehovah's Witness and I still will be 100% anti it, whatever very variation and version of it will exist then. Big shout out to people who put out videos. For me personally, the XJW YouTube community is massively important. I send out your videos, guys, long before I've done videos because I've, I've been watching this stuff for five years. Um, I try to watch still, even though I'm pretty emotionally detached from it. But I try to watch from time to time because my family is in it. So I always want to know what I, what is my family being taught now, you know. Um, like right now with the whole COVID-19, I, I watched. Not because I was one of those people who was like, oh, it's the end of the world. No, some one or two people WhatsApp me who have also left and I was like, listen, it's, there's no end of the world JW version happening. All right, number one. Number two, this is not the end of the world. This is just but another sickness that is happening in the world. And hopefully we survive as a species and we move on, you know. Um, so no, no, no qualms, no delusions about it at all. Um, not really that I have to explain that part, but I'm, a, I'm also 100% atheist. I'm an atheist, you know. According to, to Richard Dawkins, one to seven, I'm a seven. Um, for the longest time, I used to think, wow, Jehovah's Witnesses really ruined Jehovah or God for me. But I had to come up to a realization that was outside of being a Jehovah's Witness that I was not a religious person. I never had been. Um, my values and principles had never been about being a religious person and especially about theirs. And they actually... I think I read this once and I resonated with me. I, it's not that I'm anti-religion. Religion and its principles are anti-me. And I think that's the long and the short of it with that. Thank you to everyone who puts up videos. Long before, uh, uh, long ago, 2015, 2016, I was even on the XJW subreddit. Um, I used to read a lot there. Um, it helped me to really deconstruct a lot of things that I always knew, but my, my, I would short circuit at some point, and now I've got a chance to make the whole entire circuit make sense. Um, I haven't been on the subreddit maybe for the last three, four years. I really literally not, have not even clicked on it once, but I hope it's growing in numbers. Um, just because of my lifestyle, I'm always busy, even at work, when all these other personal things I do, um, I don't get time to actually physically read something like that but unlike youtube channels i can put them on and headphones on my ipad just listen to a john cedars um deconstructing a a broadcast for example just to know i'm listening oh okay that's what they're saying now oh my god these people all right <laughs> you know and if i have time i'll put it on my tv up on the youtube here or whatever and watch you know it's it's neither here nor there, nor there for me but it's important work and i always say as everyone always says like subscribe that it goes up with the algorithms i always do that um i remember watching uh maybe a funny funny little story before i end uh five years ago i couldn't watch don cedars he had a beard and had loose looking hair and he just felt he looked like an apostate to me i couldn't watch kim and mikey i think that's their name because my kid, like the long hair, yeah, I can see in the background there's a Jehovah's Witness books, but no. By the way, that's not the Jehovah's Witness books, that it's not. I just realized they actually look like them. <laughs> yeah, um, I probably still have one or two. I've kept one or two. The ones that I know are no longer in print and not available online. I don't know why, but I feel like one day if I ever had to show something to my parents, if they ever allowed me, I want to be able to show them because they're going to say if it's online, it's a posted lies. Yeah, but anyway, um, but we live in hope, right? Um... So I couldn't watch those guys. And it's funny because it was just appearance. That's how, that's what they did to us. It's crazy because I feel I'm such a liberal person. But even I was like, no, I'm not watching this guy. And then JT, um, I watched JT's uh, famous video, XJW, Better Light Leaves, the organization. about JT is a black South African. Representation matters. He just looked like me, you know. Um, and he also looked like every Jehovah's Witness from the Amer from America who would come to South Africa for a what did you what did they call it the international conventions right no he just had that thing you know um, and he looked like and he was wearing a tie and a white shirt and he had a a plain background I was like okay he looked like a brother 
maybe I can listen. You know, maybe you really didn't lead Jehovah for the wrong reasons. Because at the time, I thought that unless it's doctrine, it's not a good reason. And absolutely, guys, I am here to tell you, and anyone who's watching this in South Africa, whatever reason you have to leave the Jehovah's Witness religion, cult, this thing that we were raised in, this thing we were part of, whatever reason you have, it's good enough. If you are in an abusive relationship, you can knock the guy out and get your power back as a woman. You can plan an elaborate plan for finances and all of that and then leave. You can get out via the window while he's gone to the garage with only one pair of clothing that you're already wearing and you're out the door. Whatever you do, that is just an analogy and it's maybe a, a harsh one, but I always say what we were a part of was abuse. I was in a, an abusive relationship with the religion I was born in. And how you live doesn't matter. It matters that you live. If I ever say anything that, if anyone has watched these 30 minutes or so that I'm, I've been rambling, <laughs> um, it is that whatever reason you have to live, if, you, if it just doesn't feel right, that's enough. If something feels off, that's enough. If you feel like the brothers are not loving, that's enough. If 1914 doesn't make sense, that's enough. If you cannot calculate the three and a half times, which is supposed to be 2,552 weeks of whatever, that's enough. Um, if it's doctrine, that's enough. If you were treated badly in your judicial committee and you feel like these men, that's enough. Whatever reason you have. Um, and the key is that we leave. So I put up this video up. up always available. I think if I can figure it out, because I haven't even tried to figure this out yet. I've just decided to put up my video, record my video, and hopefully I'll be able to post it up. But if I do, um, I'll put up my Twitter. I tweet about this stuff. I'll always challenge your businesses on Twitter and all those kind of things. My name on Twitter is I am underscore C F E S S I Y A F I E R C E. Yeah, that's me. I also have the Twitter account, uh, not Twitter, um, Instagram account, the underscore bearded underscore Ayanda. Um, yeah, so my beard, I've had it for five years. I've never shaved since that time. And it makes me, I probably will never shave ever again. I tell my girlfriend, you probably will never see me with no hair. Um, yeah, so I'm divorced and I have a lovely girlfriend who's a great human being and I love her. And we have a great life. And thank you for listening if you've come this far. Um, and I hope my video helps you in some way or the other. Goodbye.